Hello everybody, hope you're doing well. Today I'm going to talk about this method of deconditioning the mind. Because one of the first things that we get into when we start traveling this path, the spiritual path, is the understanding of the mind as a, an element that is crucial for us to harmonize our life. So I want to first establish that. The foundation of any spiritual work must be recognized for what it is. This foundation is the harmonizing of your life. And harmonizing is just another word that is limited in its context, but it helps to understand that this is the purpose that every seeker has in their life, has in their path. Harmonizing is simply that you are okay with any circumstance, any situation, that you are fine, that you are not being uh, thrown around by the emotions of the situations and the people that you encounter and so on. When we seek spiritually, we're trying to harmonize this beingness that we are. So if we can accept that as the foundation of what is the spiritual path, and then we start boarding what is the analysis or investigation of the mind, then we are on good footing here because we acknowledge that what we are looking for is harmony. Within this harmony, there is peace, there is joy, and there is love. Everything that any human, at least on a positive path, would want and desires and yearns for. Now you have heard me talk about this harmony, peace, joy, love, being contained within the self. And that is true. We're going to talk about that. But we're interested in the workings of the mind, which is actually what's causing this distortion that we call creation, that we called a self and other self, subject and object. So we have to dive carefully into what this mind is. And I'm going to do it in a segmentation of three parts. These three parts, we kind of know already, I'm going to try to keep it simple and efficient, and is the unconscious mind and the conscious mind as the two elements that are in dynamic, working together to project reality. But there's something in the middle that we call the subconscious mind. And the subconscious mind is what's going to bring most of our attention to in this episode. The subconscious mind is that which contains the programs and the thought patterns of our life. What we see every day, how we react to things, how we engage with certain people and so on. It's almost like it has all our biases and preferences and inclinations and so on. The unconscious mind, on the other hand, is what feeds the subconscious mind, or at least attempts to feed the subconscious mind, depending on what the malleability and permeability actually of the subconscious mind is. And the unconscious mind also has a vast resource um, of all the elements that are needed for the conscious mind, which I'll talk about in a second, to live in harmony. In other words, the unconscious mind contains everything that the conscious mind wants and needs to satisfy this yearning of harmony. But the subconscious mind lies in the middle as a sort of obstacle, but it doesn't have to be this way, of course. The conscious mind, on the other hand, is simply that which observes and interprets everything that it sees. It creates experience out of what it's being seen. And so the conscious mind is dependent on the subconscious mind, primarily, and then the, the unconscious mind, which is the vast resources that exist for the conscious mind to either interpret reality in a way that is incongruent with itself. Why? because itself or himself or herself 
is harmony, is love, is peace. So it may either see incongruency, which we find as something undesirable, or congruency, which is something desirable, something that we, we like and we, we appreciate. Now the incongruency is brought into being by the interplay between the subconscious mind and the conscious mind. There is some interaction there in the unconscious mind, but I won't talk about that because we're interested in the deconditioning of the mind. Now let's talk about the deconditioning of the mind or actually the conditioning of the mind. When we refer to a conditioned mind, we're in essence talking about a mind that has been uh, programmed by the external factors of its environment. And in this case, we're talking about uh, our lives being influenced by the external world. And so we speak about a conditioned child or a conditioned adult that learned all of this of how to relate and how to behave and how to do things and all of this. All of these are external influences that do, of course, uh, influence heavily the subconscious mind and it creates the patterns in which we are behaving. But this doesn't happen without help of the unconscious mind because the unconscious mind is, um, is always feeding the conscious mind. It is providing the resources. And so you can say the subconscious mind in a way is a distorted version of the unconscious mind that the conscious mind perceives. So that's why we're interested in reprogramming, as it were, the subconscious. We hear this a lot and there are many methods that are used with great efficiency to do this. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Now, a way to perceive this system is computers. If you know anything about computers, you would know that there is a hard drive that is no longer now a hard drive. Well, some of us still have hard drives because we store a lot of information. <laughs> Uh, but now there's also the solid state drive, which is the flash drive or the one that is, it's not a hard drive anymore, so we don't call it hard drive. Still for this episode, I'm just going to call it the hard drive. A hard drive is the unconscious mind, which contains all the information that is needed for the operating system to work in an efficient way. And that efficient way is harmony, fluidity. Then there is the RAM memory, which is what contains the programs and the little details of execution for the operating system, which is the conscious mind, to effectively uh, work and without much delay and so on. That's, that's a great uh, way to describe all these three patterns of unconscious, subconscious and conscious mind. It's all information, as you can see. But there is a hierarchy, if you will, of the, the, the passing of the information. Whereas the operating system is just simply the projection of what's coming out of the subconscious mind. And the subconscious mind is being influenced, of course, by the unconscious mind and the external world. So in the spiritual path, what we're interested in is in the deconditioning of the mind. Okay. And we're going to work on the RAM on the memory, the subconscious mind. Now there's something interesting in computer work and technology that it's called a memory dump. The memory dump is the process in which all the contents of a RAM, because of an error usually, are copied into a file. You can do this manually too, but um, that's the process. You copy all the information of the memory of the RAM into a file for further analysis. And this analysis will review, in essence, the patterns, um, what was happening, the program that was running, uh, the processes that were uh, in the operating system at the time, and. It, it's, a, it's almost like a snapshot of everything that was happening at the moment so they can recreate the error. 
in the spiritual path, we call this meditation, is where we sit and analyze our thoughts. And this is just a general term or a general description of what meditation can be. But I'm going to take it a little bit further, of course. The important part here is to know that the process of analyzing the REM is what we're interested in. That is the process in which we're going to create the bridge and reprogram or decondition the subconscious mind to create more harmony. Because again, as the premise of this topic is, we encounter at the beginning of our spiritual awakening that there is a lot to, to be deconditioned. This is what we call dark night of the soul, separate self, ego, and so on. All these things that are coming out. So we need to get dive into the subconscious mind and allow these changes to happen. So when we do this, we are working a little bit more in line with the unconscious mind because we're, um, as it were, turning off the operating system in favor to or bringing the operating system into analysis of these programs, of these errors that keep happening. The modern human works or operates normally with their subconscious mind filled with these programs that repeat over and over and are cyclical in nature. You can call these catalysts, if you will. And so there is very little interest into getting into the subconscious mind because there is fear or there is unknowing and so on. This is the natural state of the modern human who is not interested in any type of mindfulness or knowing the self. Why is this helpful? Because we need to understand that that's where we come from. We come from a desire to maintain things as they are because we are afraid of change. But the more the spiritual path precip precipitates on us, or in other words, um, the more this intensifies, this seeking intensifies, then the more we want these changes to happen. And so we're going to talk about here how these changes happen or can happen. But it's important to know where we come from because we know that we have certain sensitivities to maintain these programs in the REM despite of the errors that are causing because we we're just used to it. We just bypass them. We don't care about the errors. It literally is, as I used to work with computers in the past, finding computers that were um, slowed down to a point where users couldn't even uh, open their email. And uh, people usually thought that they needed a new computer. Some people might say here that they just need another life. <laughs> they need to reincarnate again because this life is done. Well, all they needed really was a format of, well, that was my easy way to, to solve the problem is formatting the computer. It's very simple, factory reset, and everything would run as if it was new. And that's what we're looking for here, but not quite formatting. In this case, we're, we can format. <laughs> we can only uh, see what the errors are because we're having a different approach. And yet that is the desire that most people have to maintain that. So we have to face those desire to maintain them. And um, once we do that, then we're faced with a decision. Now, most of what you will see in the spiritual path, all the modalities that exist, uh, suggest that we can reprogram the mind. This is true. It is quite possible once you become aware of the, pro the problem, when you do the memory dump on the file and you see uh, the snapshot of what was happening, then you can reprogram for the error not to happen again, but also with something that you want to happen. In the subconscious mind, this works as follows. You become aware of something that um, dissatisfies you. And you have an idea of what you want to substitute it with, you see? And so we, we are now in 
the possibility of changing at will something that we have in mind. Now, I didn't resonate with this approach. The reason being is that when you have in mind already what you want as a substitution for what is, the subconscious mind has a thought pattern. And now the conscious mind will think of something to fit in, to substitute the problem. This didn't work for me. This tend to create it, although useful, it tended to create um, expectations, predetermined ideas of what I wanted. And if anything in my operating system didn't conform with my new uh, view, then uh, the reprogramming didn't seem like it worked too much for me. Again, this is happening regardless of what we're doing. It's only that in the reprogramming, there is the possibility of us creating a, an expectation and that expectation will be met with disappointment eventually. This doesn't mean that it always have to create expectation, but there is a possibility of creating expectations. And so what this brought me to was to the simple observation of the subconscious mind. So here's what happens. Like I said, this memory dump is what we call meditation. It is the process in which we can analyze the mind, in which we can see the mind for what it is and allow these processes to happen. And in the happening, we become aware of the little details of the errors that are happening in our subconscious mind. This requires two things. The first thing is to know who you are, to know deeply who is the observer of the thoughts. Now, why is this important? Because when we're not in tune or we don't know ourselves, we truly don't know who we are, we are liable to create another character within the mind that will analyze the thoughts. And that character will create a definitely an expectation and it has rules. Any character that is not you, that is illusory, will have its own agenda or it, have, it will have its own uh, preferences as to what should be and what shouldn't be. Most of meditation in the Western world or modern world in general is characterized by this reflection. As the word says it, it's not meditation, it's reflection, is reflecting something that is already there. And so that reflection is made by what we call the separate self or the ego, in which there is a constant analysis of what we should be doing and shouldn't be doing. You see, there is a judgment. And that's a good way to paint it. You see, the way this happens is that there is usually, so you can see how this, this generates, it's how the character is not really the observer or God or uh, pure consciousness, whatever you want to call it, you. The ego is not you, is what I'm trying to say here. How? Because take, for example, something that you're familiar with. You become aware of a discrimination. Imagine that you're discriminating against somebody and you find it and you say, I'm judging this person. You see, I'm discriminating this individual. The moment you realize that there is a, just a split second away, an ego to come out and say, judging is not good. See, this happens in our meditation. We're sitting there and we become aware of that discrimination. And then there is a following thought that says, you shouldn't be judging. That is bad. That is not the observer. That is not who you are because you, are impartial. You have no ideas of what's good or bad. Only an ego can know if it's something good or bad. 
not you. So you see, you're not being yourself there, you're being the ego. And now this exacerbates further because you can become aware of how you're judging the discrimination. In other words, you're judging the judgment. And so another character may show up and say, see, that's not proper meditation. What you're doing is judging yourself. That it's not you either. But then another thought can come up and so on. You see, it reverberates in, in an eco fashion or an echo, not an eco. <laughs> so to avoid these echoes of voices within your mind, you want to know who you are. That's the whole per premise of knowing who you are. Now there is a beauty in meditation only by simply abiding in the self. But here we're using this for the observing, the observation of the mind, the analysis of the subconscious mind. So what we do is that once we sit in ourselves, we begin to observe the thoughts. We allow this thought process to happen. And now the difference is that instead of us having an idea of what we want to do when we spot those thought patterns that are not useful, instead of that, what we do is simply observe. And in this observation, magic happens. Now that magic, I cannot explain it to you. I simply attribute it to a higher intelligence, which you may call the higher self. I simply call it higher intelligence because it's beyond my conscious mind's intelligence. And it just knows what it's doing. Now in the model that I explain, we have the unconscious mind and we have the conscious mind. The subconscious mind lies in the middle. The unconscious mind has this intelligence and knows what it wants to substitute without the conscious mind getting into interference with it, which is what may create the expectations. This is not to say that your conscious mind uh, can know what the unconscious mind wants, but sometimes it's better just to trust. And that is one of the biggest fears that we have as humans. We like trust in the unknown. In fact, we fear the unknown. And so fearing the unknown is fearing myself because I am the undefinable, indivisible, imperturbable self. Trusting in the unknown is this process of observation, simply allowing the awareness of the thought patterns to shine on them. And what occurs is something similar as when you have a false perception of anything. Imagine you're walking in the forest and you see something and you think is whatever it can be, an animal, a tree falling or a person hiding behind the tree. And so you have this perception that's a thought pattern that is uh, it needs to be challenged, it needs to be uh, seen. Once you see it, magic happens. And you say, oh, it's not, it's just a branch or is a vine or whatever it was. You see it for what it is. By seeing it for what it is, magic happens. You see, you didn't have to intellectualize. You can explain it intellectually afterwards and say, oh, it was, it was this. But at the moment, you say that after the fact, you don't say it before realizing it. So that's the magic I'm talking about. It's a realization, it's a knowledge, it's a direct knowledge, direct experience. And that is the product of observing the thoughts as opposed to thinking that you have to fix yourself and you have to change things and that you have an idea of what you're supposed to be. In a way, that is still a separate self talking, desiring things that are not present. Whereas in this method, you are fine with everything that is happening. And that uncomfortable part 
It's only when you're not being yourself, you're being the ego who is saying, oh, these thought patterns are not good. And so you allow that to be too. This is a process that requires faith because faith in the unknown is the biggest faith that you can have and trust, trust that this magic will happen because it's just a byproduct of observation. You become fascinated with this process. And like I said, I have tried the other ones in the past. To me particularly, they didn't work or they worked, but not in the way that created this uh, imperturbable harmony within myself. That is, it, they didn't create it actually, it just revealed this observing revealed more and more this equanimity that is just being fine with what is. And so that is a the method. And it's not something that I have created or that only I have experienced. We have thousands of years of tradition using this simple observation, but it needs to be centered on the self not on anything else, on the pure absolute self that observes, doesn't judge, and it just becomes aware of that which is and nothing else. So that's all I got for the model, which I wanted to explain of deconditioning the mind through the power of observation. And for anybody interested in the description, you always find links for my work and what I'm doing. So go check it out if you're interested. I have nothing else to say, but thank you so much for watching all the way up to here or listening if you are on a podcast platform. And that's it. Take good care of yourself. Have a good day, good night, wherever you are. And I'll see you in the next episode.